drums, creating conversations with the world's top drummers in the most extreme genres. This episode is brought to you by Los Cabos Drumsticks, Canada's number one choice for drumsticks. They provide the wood you need to make the beats you deserve. Los Cabos Drumsticks. Now with your host, Corey Hopping. What is up? We're talking drums coming back at you. Another podcast. We're just ripping our way through 2024, eh? Well, we got a good one this week. It's pretty killer. I'm I'm very excited about it. I've been waiting to talk to this man for quite some time before we hop into it. Just want to let y'all know my band Lotharo is hitting the road. That's right. We are cruising our way all over North America. We're kicking things off in our hometown of Hamilton, March 15th for our album release. We've got a brand new album, Chasing Euphoria, out on Atomic Fire RPM Records. So make sure you go check that out, Lotharo.com, for all the info. If the dates for our tour are not coming close to your city, just wait. We do have more dates to be announced very soon. Not sure when, but uh, hopefully, hopefully I come to a city near you and we can hang out. Drop me a DM. We can uh, we can chill while I am in your city. Hope to see some awesome fans out for some awesome hangs. Okay, that out of the way. What else do we got here? Huh? We got a little bit of time to kill, don't we, before we get into this one? Uh, My guest this week is John Longstreth. We had a killer chat about all things drums. Obviously, we talk blast beats, but we also talk about the new pedal from Pearl, the Pearl Demon XR which he had a hand in the R&D of. Uh, so he had a lot to say on that. I am greatly looking forward to checking this pedal out and getting my little feeties on it to see what all his hype is about. Um, we also talk about a recent surgery he had, which as a drummer, it is very, uh, very scary. We use all our limbs, all our our muscles and tendons to play our instrument. And this was a pretty, pretty serious thing that he went through. Uh, It is really awesome to to have him well and uh, on the road. That's right. Origin is on tour uh, with Vader right now in North America. Make sure you go check them out. Uh, hopefully you don't miss them by the time you hear this podcast. So make sure you check the dates below and go see John live. He, uh, he is an absolutely insane drummer. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to him, uh, before, right, 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 right. Before we hop into that, I just want to say we do have a Patreon page. If you enjoy this episode, you enjoy all our other episodes, or maybe you only enjoy a couple of them, uh, but you want to support this podcast that I've been doing for over three years now, uh, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com backslash we're talking drums. Links will be in the show notes. So head on over there. You can sign up for free today. Uh, and, uh, we have all kinds of little, uh, behind the scenes things, Uh, Lots of stuff with our guests and all the episodes early. So check it out if it's something you're into. If not, then, you know, if you can just drop a sub on YouTube, follow on Instagram, uh, like, share, you know, all of that fun stuff. It's all free, doesn't cost anything, and it helps push this podcast to as many people in a positive way. So I thank all of you for doing that in advance. Let's get into this one. This is my conversation with John Longstreth of Origin. 
John Longstreth, welcome to the We're Talking Drums podcast. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Everything's going awesome today. Not a single problem has happened. It's been wonderful. No, no. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. I've been listening to this for quite a bit. It's cool, man. There's a podcast for, it's, it's mostly metal drummers, isn't it? Mostly metal drummers. Um, yeah, like they're, I, I had some more of the like rock guys on and stuff like that, but uh, I've kind of leaned into the more extreme drummers. Uh, I don't know. It's what I'm personally drawn to. Uh, most of them are like friends of mine and stuff. So it's kind of just how it's gone. Um, all the guys in the extreme metal scene are just awesome, nice dudes. And that's the people I want to talk to. Right. So well, we have a good, a good method of, of exposing, exposing, um, yeah. Of getting rid of bad energy. Right. Makes yeah. it of the day. I suppose. Yeah. Do you, that's, that's funny too, because I always find um, anytime I'm on the kit and I have a, like a really good practice session and I'm just like, like my, my BPMs are, are maxed and like, I'm just sweating my ass off. I always feel like I got rid of so much like negative energy and I feel, I just feel really positive afterwards. Yeah. So, I mean, like my girlfriend, she'll chase me out of the house so I can go play drums for two or three hours so I can come back and be a more, you know, there's a certain person she's looking for in me. That yeah. Doesn't exist until I go and play drums. So she go play drums. Drums make drummer happy. I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess it does. And yeah. I play, man, I'm, I play, I'm playing six days a week these days. Oh shit! Um, yeah, well, we got a tour coming up, man. But uh, that's right. Yeah, it's great, man. I I come here. I you know I work my fucking day job. I come here and I put in about three hours and go home. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. It's like um, e even maybe when you're not practicing as much, like for a tour or whatever. I'm sure your girlfriend's just you. You just start to get annoying or something, or I just find that things. I, I get like frustrated at things way easier if I haven't played drums in a couple of days. Well, yeah, it just, you know, I mean, it's, it's exercise. It bumps your dopamine up. It's just yeah. all good for you. As long as you're not, you know, doing, you know, excessively harmful things to yourself. Like, I don't know, but, uh, like, like blasting at 280 for like eight minutes straight, you know, well, like, <laughs> It depends on how you're blasting at 280 for eight minutes straight. How are you? Bl I can't blast for 280 at eight minutes straight. My no, God. no. Why are you blasting for that long? Who needs a 280 for eight minutes straight? <laughs> I guess that would be Vital Remains. Vital yeah. Remains, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Do they have eight minute songs though? Maybe. Maybe. They've got long songs. They've got yeah. long songs. I don't know if they got to 280, but they got up when De Christian Eyes came out. And it, and it was still, you know, it was in the early 2000s, and we were all still on the Democratic message board. <laughs> that album came out. It's like, Whoa. Um, might as well have been 280. It was 280 for 2003. But, yeah. Dude, these days, 280s, like, in death metal, just seems like the standard. Like, it's insane. Bands like, uh, like Archbire and stuff doing this, like, 400 BPM. It's like, where does it stop? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I guess we're, I don't know, because they're, I, I had to do a Hate Eternal song, and it, the, the name of it slips my mind. It'll come to me about five minutes from now. Um, but it's a straight 280, two-foot blast. Um, it's one of the hottest songs. And, yeah, that, that had to, I had work, see, Playing really fast with Origin live without a click is pretty easy. But being here in this room, you know, by myself after work uh, on a click track, that's difficult. Getting that, getting that tempo without the live presence is really difficult. 
but yeah, yeah. What well, that first the song on that f- that recent Vader record, the last one that James uh, James Stewart was on, that's got to be two ninety, maybe three hundred. Really? Oh, so I mean, it shocked me. I I was like, Ugh. I think it's actually called shock and awe, but. Um, <laughs> So you don't play a cl- with a click at all live and never have with Origin? I do. I do. I kind of bounce around with that. Um, oh. I, for instance, other bands like the Hate Eternal set was, if, if, if the Hate Eternal set was 10 songs, eight of them were on a click track. Um, Origin is kind of mixed bag, 50-50. Sometimes there's click, sometimes there's not. Um I am preparing to go out on this upcoming tour with click tracks though. Yeah. It just um it does two things like it does two things for me is I start the song at the same BPM every time. That's really the most valuable thing. Second valuable thing and you notice it after you've played on a click track and then you get off the click track is that there's a physical element that's removed from not having to count yourself for having right. some kind of count for you and it kind of frees up a little more hard drive space for me and i'm like whoa you know counting is almost like physically sitting up where mm-hmm. now i don't have to count so now it's just easier to but you know terrible things can happen too like the whole band can come off the click and not find their way back and then you have to be able to kill the click and finish the song without the click and yeah, you don't want to get super reliant on it. You don't want the click to die and that have the band die. So if the click dies, you got to keep going and play the song and make it like nothing happened. And that can be a little challenging sometimes. But yeah, yeah. Um, now, when you guys, when you're on the like, when you go out on this tour and you have the click tracks, is the whole band gonna be on the click? Just you? No, 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 just me. Yeah. Okay, I've done it both yeah. ways. Yeah. One of one of my bands, everybody has a click track, so we don't need count-ins or anything, and I love it. It's amazing. I don't need to count in the song. Everybody just comes in when they're supposed to. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. Um, but then my other band, I'm the only one on the click. So if I get off, they have no idea. I right. just think that, like... I and also I can't really hear them either. So that's kind of how you have to do it yeah. sometimes because you, you well I was on a click one night and the front monitors were really loud. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. And uh I don't know if they couldn't hear me so well, but I think the vocalist came off. And so they just latched onto the vocalist because his monitors are real loud. So the whole band, or the 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 front of house, the front of the band was an entire beat somewhere. <laughs> somewhere, and not with you, not with me. So <laughs> we're we're cruising like this, but they ended the song an entire beat either after or forward. So it was kind of funny, but. Playing like it would be nice to be on the click the first couple of weeks of the of the um excuse me it'd be nice to be on the click the first couple of weeks first week of the tour maybe and then maybe after that if I'm feeling good enough maybe I'll just kill off the click and just you know yeah just free ball it yeah free ball it yeah I mean. (laughs) Because then you can crash the song and catch back up and everybody can laugh at you and the crowd can be like, wow, you know, because Mm -hmm. that's another thing. Like you get to like just me being on the click feels right for this band. The moment we um, the moment we get a a on stage down stage i don't know what you call it but you know the guys they guys get on stage with an x32 and everybody's got their their mixes and all that the moment my band the moment origin gets on stage with that setup i'm gonna have to check everybody's forehead to see if they're ill or not because (laughs) where in the hell did you learn that technology so fast they (laughs) yeah yeah it's not you guys go up you shred and uh 
and that's it. You don't you don't need technology or anything. You guys still use like full amps and everything on stage? We use amps. I'm surprised they're not gas powered. They're so big. Yeah. <laughs> I mean Um No, Mike and Paul, man, they got they got these mega rigs and they create a lot of heat and they melt faces and it's fucking cool. Mm-hmm. No. Um not to be old man, you know, barking at clouds and hollering about kids these days, but yeah, there's there's a certain level of technology that that we will use on stage and that'll pretty much be down to me. Um but there's a lot of boundaries we don't really want to step past. You know, there's a, yeah. there's a level of authenticity that we kind of consider upon ourselves that we like to present to people. And I think people are into that. I think people might be into this band because they're, they're using all that stuff. That they, uh, and then they're going to be into this band, you know, for that. Yeah, I definitely get it. And even when you listen to your albums, it's like, it makes sense for you guys to keep that raw energy and sound live, get real amps, even like not playing to a click and all that. Like it makes sense for you guys. Cause you guys have kept that true to your sound across all your records. Like no matter how much like modern production gets out of control, like it is these days, like it's insane how like, crazy production can sound you guys even listening to the last couple records you guys are staying true like you can blatantly hear that's you playing Mm. like the drums like there's no doubt in my mind as soon as i put on that first track that that's you playing that kit mistakes and all yeah exactly like it it adds to the grit and the 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 feeling of everything like it it sounds really good but it's it's like almost being in the room with you playing like yeah i mean that's like we came up you know back in back in the old days when when we all lived in kansas and all that i mean one of our things was you know we, we had these shed fests and there was a whole like we called them shed fests because it was like a storage unit company and all the bands rented you know rented rooms at that storage unit and we would at that that was back at the time where you could open up your storage unit um have a chest of beer chest of beers and fire up a grill and there'd be five or six bands from the scene that would just hang out jam a lot of people would show up and yeah so that's just kind of how we grew up playing together as a band so keeping you know coming up today keeping it i wouldn't call us old school but keeping us old school to our time is important yeah yeah, definitely. And speaking of time, man, you guys have been around for what uh, close to twenty-seven years now as yeah. a band. Uh, Paul started it in two thousand nineteen ninety-seven. Yeah, ninety-seven. I, I joined in ninety-eight, maybe. Yeah, you know, yeah, something like that. But, yeah, so like yeah like 26 years you guys have been going that's yeah. a that's a feat in itself keeping a band together that long <laughs> jesus yeah we we learned a while back it was kind of funny because there was because i was in the band for a minute and then i left for a bit or depending on who you talk to i left or was let go or um but I, you know, that point in time, we were kind of in each other's faces and kind of barking at each other a lot more, you know, Mm -hmm. as I came back into the band, everybody's kind of like, well, this band's kind of cool, you know, it's going somewhere. Let's, let's put something into it. And like, even today in person, we get along perfectly. It's the, 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 the the four way text conversation, (laughs) which can cause trouble sometimes. It's like, oh yeah. Just because there's, yeah, I don't know, but no, we get along well enough to keep doing this. Yeah, so we actually we haven't been out in a while. 
My last time we were out was this time last year. We were oh, yeah? in Europe, we were in Europe with Monstrosity and um it just I don't know what happened. We just lost the year it seems and so now we've got uh Vader coming up in a month with Vader in the states and then after that yeah. we got a, a little over a month with Marduk in Europe. Yeah, man. Those are two killer tours for you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Excited. We toured with Vader twice, like in 2000 and 2001, I think, way back in the beginning of the band. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that was when, you know, that was, uh, that would have been Litany and Revelations. Mm -hmm. So I got to snuggle up next to Doc and watch him and get to know him and that was that was eye opening and and really awesome yeah so yeah. looking forward to being out with those guys again that'll be great oh hell yeah man i think those those uh early tours where you're kind of like the support band or whatever and you get to spend some time with guys who have been on the road a lot more mm -hmm. and like sit down with other drummers and, and like just get a feel for it more. Like people outside your like local scene and everything like those are like, for me at least like the early days of touring and getting to sit down with uh, other big drummers, like, and just getting to talk shop and talk drums with them. It like, it changed how I like did my warm ups or did anything like that, like getting a different drummer's perspective on it. Cause when yeah. you're just doing the local stuff, it's, it's not the same as going on these bigger tours, playing in front of bigger audiences and everything like that. Like it's, it's a whole different vibe. It's like a different day to day, like everything about it and having somebody there is like, it's, it makes it a lot easier when you got cool guys that you're playing with too. Yeah. And like, you know, like a lot of the bands that we went out with, you know, when we were still like when, when the band was still not even five years old, like we went out with cryptopsy and they were still young, you know, Vader was, I don't think Vader has ever been young. No, <laughs> but like Vader, you know, um, what was another really good example? Um, Man, it was just in my mind, and now it's now it's now it's gone. But uh, yeah, at Cryptopsy, they were still young. Got to know those guys, you know, when it was early, and it's it's cool because you know now at this point in time, you know, Cryptopsy, they're all grown up. This band is all grown up. These guys are all grown up, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I remember sitting with Doc and having him explain to me how. He triggers his snare and his kick drums from the same Alesis D4, and he would put a trigger right at the mid, right at right at midnight on his snare drum, and he had a sponge from a sink, right? So he cut out the little thing for where the trigger went, and he stuffed the sponge in there and put a big mess of duct tape so the snare just kind of went, and then they would mic the underside of it, and oh wow, and they were getting this killer sound you know back in 2001 back when it was still you know analog boards mm. and elise's d4 you know and so <laughs> d4 i know i had i still have a elise's dm5 kick in here i got one right there um, yeah i don't want to get rid of it uh, no no point um, i don't even know if the screen on mine works anymore <laughs> yeah mine's still in decent shape like I use it for touring, but uh, uh, I only got a, the TM2 like two years ago. I was like, ah, it's time for an upgrade. You know, I can't use this reggae kick anymore. <laughs> Clack. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, the TM2 is wonderful. And you should buy a second one <laughs> just in case because it's yeah. cheap. I mean, yeah. it's very they're very convenient, but it's like I've... I've had people tell me that, why did it do this? I'm like, I've never seen it do that before. But yeah. I know they're capable of doing some wacky things every now and then when they get old. Mm -hmm. I'm taking my SPDSX out this time. Oh, nice, nice. I'm trying to I'm trying to kit down a little bit because for the longest time I've been using two TM2s, you know, 
and a tablet, and then a mixing mm-hmm. Little mixer console guy. So one TM2 triggered the kicks. The other TM2 was just for the 808. And then everything was going into the little mixer. I had my little mixer guy. And then I had the uh, the tablet that played all the samples and the clicks. Mm-hmm. So now I'm thinking I can get, get away with having everything in the XPDSX and just route it through my little mixing, my little mixer guy. And that should be it. That should work perfectly. Uh, I know we had one um, this is, uh, like two years ago or so, um, and it worked great. It was fantastic. You could run every everything I needed through it, and it mm-hmm. worked perfectly. So, yeah. Yeah, that should work great for you. And it, it really just condenses everything down. It's less parts. Yeah. So, yeah. Less it's cables. Cool. Like, Yeah. But... <laughs> Less money at the airport, really. That's yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of that's kind of the catalyst, of, you know, for everything for me. Can I fit it in my Pelican case and get it at fifty pounds and not have you know not not trigger the TSA people or the airline, whatever the yeah. hell. Yeah, so, that's a big thing that I'm looking at doing uh, is is putting together a case so it has my essentials mm-hmm. like my pedals uh my trigger module and like sticks yeah pretty much like anything that i need behind my kit Mm -hmm. that i need a hundred percent that i can have as a carry-on that is my big one as a carry-on as a carry-on because i don't want to lose it i've heard too many horror stories symbols like you have to check and i lost my symbols were like delayed three days when we flew to Europe last time, uh, and then I was like, good, like I was glad that I had my pedals and everything with me as my carry on. So Why are you making me nervous, <laughs> dude. I don't don't be too nervous because it's out of your control, right? I've been I've been flying with the same setup for a while. I've got pedals, triggers, um. <sighs> Yeah, pedals and electronics in the Pelican. Um, all the sticks go in the rollerboard with my clothing. That goes on the plane with me. Yeah. Symbol bag. Sorry, drummers don't. Mm. Shame face me on that. But uh, it's a substantial bag. It's a reunion blues bag. It's a, Adam Jarvis goes, look at this symbol bag. I'm just like, fuck. So I bought one of those. It's got the backpack straps on it. Oh, nice. Fancy. Yeah. And it's like it's, it's always this funny little, funny little dance the night before I leave. You take the little luggage scale and weigh everything and make sure everything is approximately three to five pounds underweight. Because I'm not convinced that their scales are dialed in at the airport. <laughs> no, not at all. But um, sometimes things get I don't know. But yeah, it's been. I've had my equipment not show up. <laughs> You know. Yeah, it's rough. Like most of us have all been there. It's uh, it's shitty. But uh, luckily, like for me, I was just doing a festival and they had all backline stuff. So I was like, whatever, I'll use whatever you got. Uh, and then the first club show that we did there, they showed up two hours before our set. Mm-hmm. So I was like, perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you got me thinking, man. I might have to throw my bass drum pedals into my my rollerboard. I think I can do that. You know what? That's right. Dude, put the if bass you drum can. pedals in with the clothing and then just put the other clothing in the pelican. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like that's I don't know. I, I anything that I can bring with me on the plane, mm-hmm. like I want, you know. I want to make sure I have as, as as much of my gear as possible physically with me mm-hmm. you know yeah because it's 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 scary out there man especially if you're flying into like france or something good luck well, we're flying into poland you know mm-hmm. like i said 90 percent. i mean i think i've lost they've lost my gear once yeah, yeah. and that was flying into germany so if you can't fly in the Frankfurt mine, <laughs> yeah, you can't fly anywhere. <laughs> you can't fly anywhere then. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, all right, let's let's get off this whole gear losing thing. That's uh, not Rumors great. Don't fly with your gear; it's terrifying. Yeah, just just don't fly or tour or do anything. Oh, <laughs> just, don't be a musician. No, no, just stay home and uh, save your money. Uh, um let's talk about practice routines man like we touched on it a little bit you're saying that you're practicing like six days a week because you're uh you're heading out on the road uh february 3rd is the first date Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure uh big old north american tour um stoked hopefully uh i'll get to see you when you're in uh toronto that'll be a good show um but Leading up to a tour, uh, are you just going through the set constantly? Do you have a routine that you do specifically every time to get warmed up, say, before you rehearse the set or anything like that? Like, what's I, uh, what's your kind of, like, daily routine in that regard? It's not set. That's the funny thing. Um, it's kind of in place currently, but I'll just kind of stumble and you know eventually land in a pattern and right now the pattern it's a little more complicated because i haven't played at origin tempos for quite a while Mm -hmm. and i had surgery on both my hands so i was off the kit for a few weeks and i just kind of took that time to build back up and uh I had a, a Slayer show. I was doing a cover band, you know, with uh, 22 Slayer songs. So that's kind of how I got back to it. And that's kind of how I, you know, slowly got back into the kit. But as of right now, you know, right now I'm just kind of doing speed runs. I know the material, you know. So next week I'll actually probably put the the click tracks in order and actually do a set. So I have about a week of doing that right now. I'm just kind of blowing through the songs, you know, yeah. bit by bit, like, and doing mostly the hard ones, for instance, like, like lately I've been practicing like ecophagy, which is the first song on the recent record. Um, uh, Aftermath is always in there. That song is difficult. Um, and we're going to play an, another new song. I think, uh, what is that song? That one song we're going to play. So I have to like rebuild rebuild that song. Um, Panoptical. So we're playing that thing. And that's got this whole fill section in there that I can't, for the life of me, can't remember how in the hell I came up with playing that in the studio. I'm like, that's difficult. So, yeah, make something new up on the spot, whatever, you know? Ah, man, you know, <laughs> yeah, I could, but I did a lot of that in the past. And I've had so many people come up to me and go, I really like that part that you didn't play that's on the album. So, well, go listen to the album then. <laughs> you come track, to a live you know? Oh, I got gotcha, you. Gotcha. Yeah, you come to a live show, you know, some stuff is uh, it's going to be a little different. Yeah, that's how I think about it. Like, you know, as long as you're not doing stuff and like completely changing parts, but like one fill here and there, maybe you could come up with something even, even better than the record. This is a specific, a specific thing that I, a I didn't think I could play when when my guitar player Paul was like, I want you to do that, and I'm like, I can't do that. And he goes, Well, just do it. You can do it. Just do it. So, and he was right. I was able to do it. And I actually got to a point where it wasn't that terribly difficult. Um, I think I popped it out pretty easily in the studio, too. So, there's a lot of practicing really difficult parts first to get that stuff done. And and then, like, lately I'm just kind of picking one song per day and just cycling it. So, like, and I, like a few days ago, it, I just, it was aftermath like 10 times in a row um and then tomorrow i don't know tomorrow it will maybe 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 tomorrow is saligia i don't know but yeah here in the next few days i'll actually put everything in order and start doing the one shots uh mm-hmm. 
And that's about a two to three hour rehearsal routine. And that includes the really dry, boring stuff, like just sitting on a click track for, you know, like you said, like an eight minute run at 280, the best you can. So in my case, it's probably more like 250, which is, that's a manageable tempo. And that's pretty funny because I remember when the second Nile record came out and nobody knew Derek Roddy was going to be playing on the second Nile record. And uh, Chapter for Transforming into a Snake came out. And that was the first time, as far as I understand, everybody associated a blast beat with a number, which was 250. So all of a sudden, you go out, and everybody's like, 250, Derek Roddy, blast beat. Yeah. And, okay, cool. So The bar was set. That, yeah, that, that's the first time there was like a bar for blast beats. There was, yeah, there yeah. was a rating instead of just being fast and super fast. All of a sudden, there was two hundred and fifty BPM. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's a lot of that, and in just being at a comfortable pace and getting the reps in, getting you know, like you said, getting the eight minutes, the ten minutes, and just trying to keep it as smooth as possible. There's that. Um, yeah, and just trying to be limber around the kit. Um, then there will be three days of rehearsal in Kansas with the band, and we will jump in a rental vehicle and drive down to Atlanta and start the tour. We should be in pretty good shape, I think. Yeah, yeah, three days of rehearsal. As long as everybody's doing what you're doing, should be mm. all good, right? So, yeah, they are, they are. Um, I mean, I wish we could have more more band practice, of course. But, mm-hmm. And that's a funny thing, too. Like, people don't even band practice anymore. You know, everybody's got the rig. Everybody's got the, the rig with the click track. and That's it. That's all I need, rig, man. Rig out and play to it. It's cool. Not <laughs> See, quite my thing, but I if I got hired for something, you know, I would think I would probably do it if they asked mm-hmm. me. Yeah. See, in my, in my case, I... I like rehearsing with my band. I really, really do. Um, but my my time on the kit, um, the last couple of weeks, I've had more time by myself. But I, it's been hard to make time outside of rehearsing, like rehearsals with the band, to practice on my own. And that is frustrating for me. Because I know that I need to sit there by myself and and play stuff and figure stuff out on my own. Because when we're playing a set, it's it's a rehearsal for a show. Like we're we're playing these songs. There's no stopping halfway through. You know, like we just we play the whole song. Everybody knows their parts, and you play it, and that's it. But I like <laughs> I just like to be able to like oh I fucked up that fill like let's go back let's play through this section again and let's nail it down or let's listen to the song and (laughs) try to figure out what i did in the studio so yeah i i really i enjoy my my time alone in the jam space i really do it's valuable it's kind of all i got right now um the guys that I share this room with, they've all got other projects that they're working on. So they're yeah. all busy with their other projects, which is, it gets a little bit lonely sometimes, but when I've got something to work on, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. I've got between now and January 29th to just sit in here and hammer on origin songs and hammer on, you know, click tracks that are 250 up and over. So yeah. <laughs> be all right. You know. Yeah, that's insane. Like I when I start my practicing, I start at like 140. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I I usually work my way up to about two two twenty is like what I'm comfortable with. Most of the stuff I play the fastest that any song is is around two hundred to I think we have one at two ten. Mm-hmm. That's like the fastest. So if I'm comfortably sitting at 220 
I'm I'm happy with that. Uh, I remember years ago, like I was like, I gotta hit 260. Like I got it. Like it was just a goal of mine. Now I'm like, I don't know. I might pull something if I'm if I'm trying to push it that hard. I don't know. If you take the time to get there, you can you can develop into it pretty easy. I don't have a. I don't think I have a click track that's faster than 265. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I I got to a point with the band at one point where I got to a point at one point you know, um, where I was seeing points. a lot of this I've seen a lot of this YouTube footage and everything was just way fast and I was actually talking to Paul about this the other day and he goes here's the set that I practice to and a lot of it's way too fast and I don't know if we're going to get that fast and that was like there's a couple of shows you know shows and songs out there that are it's almost unrecognizable i'm like what is that and i have to sit there and think about it and once the vocals come in and i'm like okay well that sounds like the burner but i'm not totally sure. I, okay it is mm -hmm. um so and that was kind of one of the things about getting me onto the click track with the band you know they were always a little skeptical about it because they heard these nightmare stories of bands you know you know, playing slow and speeding it up and all that stuff. And, you know, a lot of musicians don't like click tracks. They can be really fucking difficult. So yeah. I understand. But one of the things about being on, you know, being tight at 250 and being sloppy at 260, there's a, there's a, there's a lot in there. So, yeah. Um, but, even so, there's like, as far as being on a click is concerned, I don't think we've done anything faster than the end of uh, Beyond the Within, which is a song from Antithesis. And that ending sequence, I think, was at 271 or 272 or something like that. Yeah, it's got to um, be a weird number like that. Couldn't just be 270. Yeah, I think because I think what what happened was, is somebody in the studio just said, "Play two seventy, bitch." I'm like, Rob, put the click at two seventy. Let's go. Yeah, Rob, Rob is our engineer. Fucking <laughs> all right, here you go. And it's uh, it was five a.m. because we did that entire album on night shifts to get the because it was a discount. Yeah, so we all have been there to yeah. start at, at 11 and go until 7 a.m. or something like that. Yeah. So it's 5 a.m. Everybody's caffeinated, you know, just slamming coffee in. Nobody's thinking straight. And that's kind of how that part came. And I think Rob said something like, you're ahead of the click. Can you do it again? And I'm like, ah. He goes, I'll oh, put it up to 271.6. <laughs> and we hit the part and you know we have yeah the, and that was it and so that's kind of how that a lot of that shit happens when because at that point in time i didn't have my own click tracks and you know the engineer was paul and i would jam the part and then he would do the tap thing and he'd get the bpm and so we'd get weird clicks like 243 and yeah i don't know and then you got people that will set their clicks to push and pull. Yeah. Yeah. They, if you record like a live set of with no click and then you just set your click to that live mm -hmm. feel, right? That's definitely a lot of people are doing that now to get out of that stagnant, like set tempos mm -hmm. so to just give the, the, the live feel some life but still have that click track so you you stay on we're back on clicks again hey we're gonna get off this these uh this click track uh thing that we've been on today what a fucking death metal drummers talk about anyway mm, click tracks and beer uh triggers come on yeah <laughs> there's always triggers huh yeah yeah we could always go down that that route I can't like people don't can't get pissed off at triggering anymore. I like it's 
it's not allowed. You, you just can't do it. Well, I mean, if you if you're sitting on the internet and you're on break at your Burger King job and you don't you want to bag on somebody, yeah, you can. You can nail someone for triggers, I guess. I, I just. I, there's so much more silly, not real shit happening on stage these days that I think people have got. Me. It was so funny because like triggers. All right, he's not really playing that because you can, because triggers do the thing where you hit it once and it makes a thousand notes happen. Oh, I can't remember what it was, but something like that. <laughs> a thousand notes happen. Yeah. And then the guitar players started doing it because they got the Aphex, the Aphex, the uh, the whatever those, the the guitar mods and. And like the dude from Rings of Saturn was busted for not playing real guitar on stage or some shit like that. And so it was funny. Everybody was nailing drummers for that. And it wasn't happening because we didn't have the technology mm -hmm. at that point. Um, yeah, the best you could get was you could feather the kick drumming and get the, you know, the full velocity note. But, um, but at that point too, like you're gonna end up with like double triggering from the snare. Mm. Like there's all kinds of things. You have to actually play it. Like yeah. yeah, it's the only way to make everything sound awesome and clean. Like you have to physically play it. Just and if if you're sloppy, you're gonna sound worse. Yeah. So the thing that made me just chuck like is that yeah, the drummer's more playing it um because you could come up to the side of the stage and see it mm -hmm. but it wasn't until the guitar players started messing around with the amp modders and they were actually not playing it in a lot of cases and well you know i'm really playing i just have a guide track going on okay cool you got a guide track a guide um, track a guide track all right you got a guide <laughs> track happening um sure and then that is like where it really kind of started. And now I guess there are bands that have the pre-recorded kick drums in in the mix there somewhere. Apparently, that is happening. Yeah. But I I've mean, been I've been joking about it for years. Yeah, about being too lazy and not wanting to play my kicks. <laughs> you know, just put them in tracks. I don't care, whatever. But <laughs> that's. It was a joke, and now people are doing it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's real now. It's, yeah, it's a thing. But um, I don't know the the triggers. <laughs> I fucking know. I don't care. It's 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 a stupid conversation. We'll move on. But related to that, uh, you're playing some new pedals these days the pearl demon xr pedals mm -hmm. right how oh, that pissed a few people off for a minute didn't it yeah <laughs> um yeah dude uh let's see them there oh baby those look so when i first saw them i was like fuck they look so sexy they're this like they're good. super solid everything's yeah. just there it's clean like this is actually the prototype. You don't see this. You don't see the um the gener the the second generation Black Spring. Ooh. So yeah, they were we we went through a, quite a few different springs in the the R and D of it. Is that like a super heavy duty spring? Because I know a lot of the guys that play like the Axis pedals and stuff get like like double heavy duty springs in order to get their spring tension to the place that they need it the like black Axis, the black heavy springs um are something that i think most death metal drummers have had in their kit since since they got their first axis pedals in mm -hmm. in 98 or 97 or whatever the hell uh i have maybe eight five or six pairs of those black axis springs and they don't break um but i've broken maybe one of them um no yeah pearl did 
an extra heavy spring. So these Demon XRs, they they come with a, an extra heavy spring um, for people that play, played the Demon or are familiar with the Demon drives. Um, they eliminated the 360 degree bearing, which was at the top of the drive link. So mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but this bearing up here is now an inline bearing. And if you like, it's basically, I understand that this pedal bothers some people and it, other people are completely in love with it. It takes a lot of guesswork out because, you know, you can't really adjust the shit out of it. Like a lot of, like a lot of pedals are, you know, mm -hmm. like a lot of pedals they got, you could adjust everything and. I don't know. I guess it really comes down to what you want out of a pedal. I break a lot of gear pretty easily. Um, and when it comes to breaking bass drum pedals, they usually break at an adjustment point. Absolutely. So, um, less adjustment points make for a stronger pedal as far as I am concerned. Um, and haven't broken anything up um like we went through a couple of different a couple of different springs that they they were having uh they were having a supply issue and some springs were snapping mm -hmm. and then it turns out that their supplier had switched out the metal that he was making the springs out of and um of that, course and why wouldn't you that. do that yeah you know? um so he went back to what he was supposed to be doing and now it's fine uh extra heavy spring uh if you you know if you look at the pedal in comparison to the demon drive this guy here um because you've got you get outward and an inward position so it's i guess it's a center cam inward drive strap mm -hmm. um and that's just where it is and like i said if you're a person that wants to take the guesswork out of the adjustments and doesn't you know gets nervous by all of these extra little adjustment part points that may not be necessary to you like it when i first got the pedals i was like oh, i don't know about that you know mm -hmm. i can't i can't adjust the the beaters the, the the beater and the footboard independently i just don't know and like i got to playing on the pedals and like took a day and I was just like oh I guess I don't need any of that like because I've been on most of the modern pedals and they're all fucking wonderful they're all really cool but I've also broken most of them and you know so eh, it's an eliminator pedal so you can find the parts for it easily enough if you do break it if you break these pedals I don't fucking know what's going on you're either seven feet tall and 400 pounds or you're just being an idiot but <laughs> more, li wanted... more likely just being an idiot yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know um yeah but um no they're wonderful i've been i've been on this set for about i mean i actually recorded chaos most on them so oh. awesome so you've had them for like a year and a half or so Mm -hmm. I've been sitting on them for a bit. They, yeah. they sent a few. They had a few guys out there working on them. Uh, me, George, and I think they had a couple of European guys on them as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, play on the pedals and send in my comments. This needs to be fixed, and that needs to be. I don't like this. I like that kind of thing. Yeah. And it was pretty short. The only yeah, my only my only complaint was that 360 degree bearing that is on the demon drive mm -hmm. um, because I don't quite know why they did it, but it seemed to me that it was causing that it was creating a weak link in the chain and you're starting to get a little bit of chatter. And when you're looking at a, a direct drive pedal with ball bearings, there should be no chatter. There should be no lateral motion. Yes. And if you're a drummer that uses swivel, a if you've got a weak link in your pedal you're going to expose that weak link you're going to destroy it because you're swiveling and b that slop in the pedal is going to 
kill your fucking swivel because you're not going to have, you know, because blah. So that was what I really dug about it is that they went in and they changed that out. And that was great. Mm -hmm. I'm like, holy cow. I just like said something to the biggest drum company in the world and they listened to me. Wow. <laughs> that was really fucking cool. That made me yeah. feel all fuzzy inside. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, and, and it's so fucking cool because Pearl put out a bass drum metal that isn't meant to please everybody. Um, no. They, <laughs> and so, so many sad. guys were just mad about it because it's expensive and it doesn't do what a lot of the, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's as expensive as a lot of the, you know, the boutique pedals, but mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and as cool as a lot of the boutique gear is a lot of those guys aren't going to be able to get you parts, you know, in a hurry. So yeah, you know, I'm not trying to bag on anybody here or saying, you know, cut anybody short here, but I just yeah. got to a point where I had broken enough stuff and I'm just like, and now I'm all like, ah, it, I have a bit of an anxiety issue about it. Yeah, oh, 100%. And, like, I've I've been playing the Trick Dominators for, like, 12 years now. And you mm -hmm. can adjust almost everything on that pedal. And I have. And I'm basically back to trying to figure out what the original settings were. Because mm -hmm. that's, like, that's what I, I really want it to be. And, like, even talking to Alan Cassidy as well, he's like, my pedal settings are basically right out of the box. It's like I don't change anything, you know. So having them with less adjustment, I think if you give somebody all the adjustment in the world, they're just gonna fuck with it constantly, and then blame. Oh, yeah, and like in my case, I was I would just blame my sloppy playing on like, oh no, the pedal's not not right. I need to adjust it to find the setting for me. It's like no, the pedal's not gonna do the work for you, like. You need a setting that's going to make sense, but then you just have to get comfortable with it. Like that kind of goes with all of my gear these days too. Mm -hmm. I, I'll come in because for the longest time I would come into the room and I would start playing and it's just not working. Well, I guess I got to tilt the snare more or I got to raise the cymbals or, you know, I, I need gotta, to sit higher or sit lower or sit or... higher. I got to change my <laughs> spring tension and, you know, mm -hmm. And then I would just mess myself up and come back to the kit two days later and be like, why the hell is this like this? Yeah. There's a lot of that that would be going on. Um, so, yeah, I really try and uh, fight the urge to adjust things when my playing just isn't on or isn't on yet. A lot of times it's yeah. just within the warm up. A lot of times I just got to be patient for a half an hour and not... I'm not very patient, but yeah. Ah, oh, dude, I I feel you. And like, you it's, some time sometimes. Yeah, especially if I'm like fatigued at all going into warming up. Mm -hmm. It's just I. It's so hard just to get through that half an hour that I'm just like, nah, the, everything. My seat's wrong, and I'm changing stuff for forty minutes, mm -hmm. and then I'm like, oh okay, I guess I'll play one song and it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> and... It's an easy wormhole to, to, to fall down. So um, easy. Yeah. But yeah, I've, but I've been back up and down and back and forth, all of it, you know, different trigger modules, different triggers, two kick drums, one kick drum, double pedal. You know, at this point I am one kick drum, double pedal with the, the RT K30 right at midnight. Yeah. And, uh, well, you say so you're not using the uh, like not using the foot blasters right now. Foot blasters, on triggers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on triggers. They're on these pedals. Yeah, they're really cool, and they were working really well. And then I came in one day, and it just they didn't work. And the funny thing is, is like I don't know if I'm just used to the whatever millisecond delay, but I just work. I just tend to work better one kick drum double pedal sensor trigger or pc pc trigger uh mm -hmm. um i've got if i rim shot the snare from up here it will fire the trigger but if i rim shot the snare from up here on stage 
my sound man's going to come around and hit me in the head and yell at me. Yeah. So, so mm, I think you'll be okay. <laughs> like you'll be fine live. How much of that background banner are you catching? Oh, it's all right. I can, I can get that out of there. It'll add a nice uh, ambiance to uh, the back half of the podcast here. Oh, they're playing Say It Isn't. Say It Ain't So. Sounds like it. Let's see. Let's try this. I can't. Yeah, I can't, I can't make out what that is. Sounds like drums. All right, cool. Let's see it. There we go. Ah, it's fine. It's fine. I'm gonna leave. I'm leaving all this in too. So yeah, yeah. Just leave it in the background noise. The band oh. they get a they get a little bit of promo. Oh, okay, sure. Go back to that then. Yeah. The band's not even playing right now. They'll they'll be back on in a second. Oh, there is sick, a band sick. that lives right next door to me. They are loud as hell, and they come straight through my my mics and everything. So if I'm in here trying to record something, I you kind of have to weird. wait and <laughs> wait till they're done, and then you can track. Either yeah. that or just do something else and just consider it not a tracking day. That's happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. happened a number of times there, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, the pedals like, don't break. It's awesome. The triggers aren't breaking. Everything's really solid. You know. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, I love them. Uh, hopefully, uh, I get a chance to check them out. I'm, I'm loosely looking for a new set of pedals to play. Like I said, I've been playing the same set of Trick Dominators for about twelve years. I've done upgrades and stuff to them because the bias rods, like fall apart and wear down and all that so upgraded that stuff uh but i think i want to try something new so mm. so i'll i'll definitely be looking into those and seeing uh seeing how they feel they're really fucking simple yeah it's funny because they are they are so simple and you know there's a couple of people that are just like why would you support that why would you support such a elementary pedal such a bullshit simple meh um it works it, it, yeah it really does work it <laughs> like, like of course you know i have a different job than a lot of people do so it, mm-hmm. like I, I snapped a pedal in half like the bottom board down here how well, there was like a channel cut in the in the base that allowed you to move the into a short board. But what happened was is, you know, see how this kind of a, a rail here. This was not on a yep. demon, by the way, but it was a much thinner rail. And I guess metal fatigue set in and snapped and that that went. And dude, I was on stage with Hate Eternal. And, yeah. you know, Eric, he expects he expects results and so he fucking snapping pedals and so i ended up using one of my pedals and then george was kind enough to lend me one of his his axis pedals mm-hmm. so i had to play like three or four sets three or four shows with two different pedals and that's weird that's super weird yeah it's, <laughs> yeah. it's like sitting it, everything is uneven it's like sitting sideways yeah but they're Not simple comfortable they don't break um this will be the the first will this be the first tour i have yeah this will be the first tour i have them out on so that'll be great nice. too. and like at the end of the day too with the stuff you're playing you need you need a workhorse yeah. you know Absolutely. it's not like like a lot of like these other guys that go for like they they want feel to it and anything like we're talking about a direct drive pedal that you just need it to be fast and respond properly to your foot i don't understand why people need all these adjustments and fancy and flair and all this stuff it just well, needs to needs to work That's it is it. you gotta you gotta you know 
you we're not talking about you know buying a pair of iron cobras at this point we're talking about spending over a thousand dollars you know for a double pedal so right i understand how a lot of people don't want to spend over a thousand dollars for something that's simple mm -hmm. um, that's perfectly acceptable you know if you're going to spend between 12 and 1500 dollars on a double pedal you know obviously the options are out there but some people you know like me and it this is a no this this came to me only within the past couple years that i i think i dig the simple thing that doesn't break a lot more i used to really enjoy the super high tech handmade pedals that you know they were fucking cool i mean mm -hmm. access was great but things would go bad on those pedals and they were a small company and they couldn't get parts out to people and the company changed hands multiple times. It's like, I went back to Axis, you know, one guy got me to go back to Axis. I went back to Axis and within a month of being back at Axis, he quit and they got a new AR guy and he's not there either anymore. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> and, you know, when I was with Axis the first time, Daryl was still running the show. He was the, you know, the, the inventor and the owner at the time and he was still running it. And then he wasn't, and then Chuck and Karen were running it, and they were great. I love those two, but they were swamped. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And Zed's in there now. I hope he's doing good. Zed's a real nice guy. I yeah. sat down and talked to him a couple times, but it's just a little too, I don't know. But maybe, maybe they made a set of pedals here, Pearl, that never break. And I never have to worry about it again. That's it. And that's one of the issues I had. I have a, a set of Axis pedals as well that there's just a little too much adjustment and not in ways that I think matter to my style of playing. I get that maybe they're trying to cater to people that like pedals in many different ways. But mm. like, I just, for me, I just want a standard standard pedal and i want to be able to just like max out the spring tension and go yeah. like that's it you know and that that's the thing i've been playing with a lot tighter spring tension because i've been working on um getting my double strokes tightened and um but also being able to do swivel and doubles with the same setup that is yeah. that is my goal I want to be able that's to play. A, that's a tricky one. Yeah. But for my, for me, it's, I only play around 200. Like that's the the only time I would do doubles is when it's like 200 to 210 and for long passages. Right. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'll just use swivel. Um, it's just to conserve energy and keep things super tight and consistent. So but it seems to be it seems to be working just fine um uh, i'm like practicing it <laughs> i don't know if i'll uh, when i'll bring it to the stage uh we we leave for tour in march so mm -hmm. maybe that's when i'll i'll start busting it out um uh, but rehearsals have been going all right so you know yeah uh when you first started doing the double strokes like with your feet did was did you have like a routine that you you went through to kind of learn how to do it because now there's just so much information on the internet anybody can learn anything just with a quick google search but back then there really wasn't the same amount of youtube you were one of the first guys doing doubles that i really saw so was it like a, a difficult time trying to get those down and and learn them in the beginning i figured it out pretty quickly there was already there was already a guy named joe stronsick who had a had a thing called ballistic double bass and he was doing full heel strike toe strike boom 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 yeah and i don't remember him doing anything that was like 
I think you know his fastest shit might have been 220, 230. But he he was doing he was his approach was different because his approach was he was kind of like playing marching patterns with his feet. You know, he's doing all that cool stuff. Yeah. And I just kind of blew it off when I first saw it. I like, bullshit. Um, but I went back because I was just kind of futzing around with my pedals one day. And I just kind of started messing with it. And um, and what I ended up getting, you know, because I was first I was doing, you know, full heel strike, heel toe strike. And then after a while, I started getting the, the flat, and the, the kind of constant release thing. And yeah. Once I figured out that, I <clears throat> I would just go to the room for three hours and just drill, drill my right foot. It's Monday. I'm gonna just drill the fuck out of my right foot. Tuesday, drill the shit out of my left foot, and is doing that. And I think it took me about four weeks. And I had a I had a I had a set series of songs caught somewhere in time. My Iron Maiden. Yep. It's one of my favorites. I sound like I sound like Perky Pig. But um <laughs> Um Yeah, so getting that pop pop going. Um yeah. another one was Psycho Holiday, Pantera, because it's the slow shuffle. Da 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 Um And Leisure of Veracity was where I was really starting to put it together in more of a blast beat context because Legion of Veracity by suffocation, it's, you know, it's the original Mike Smith blast. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm like, okay, cool. Just learn how to drop the heels in between there and get those 32nd notes out of it. And that's where I really started to develop the, the bomb blast with the, 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 the double strokes. Um, went out on the road, you know, I, I developed the, I got it working and recorded antithesis with it. Um, and the first tour, it was problematic. It didn't, I couldn't, I had a terrible time getting it to work. And I think that just had everything to do with practicing in the studio, practicing with the band, um, recording, and none of those scenarios having the live energy attached to it. Yeah. So your body does weird things when you get on stage in front of people. Oh, yeah, yeah big time. It's it totally a, different. Creates a different kind of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And I think what I was doing was just like smashing the beaters in too hard and getting the kind of <clears throat> out of it, and that wasn't quite working. So after that tour, I came home, and I really tried to do it as slow as possible. Like, yeah. I think I was... There's a Steely Dan song that's like eight minutes long, and it's 101 BPM, you know. And I was just trying to get that slower than Pete Sandoval, Pete Sandoval, double bass groove. You know? Yeah. And oh, yeah. so I just did that for like two weeks. And then all of a sudden, I started feeling more more beater clearance between the notes because it, it started off as like a but a you know and my buddy chris at the time he goes your double bass sounds like slow double bass with an echo how are you gonna sell that to anybody i'm like oh, you're right and so after a while as i was able to get more distance out of that second note you know one e and ah and uh <laughs> And it's just been wash, rinse, repeat ever since then. I think yeah. it does work for me. It does work better on one kick drum. Um, if you really want to talk about how it sounds acoustically, um, it sounds better on one kick drum because it doesn't sound like er, e, er, e, er, e, you know. It just kind yeah. of um, one kick drum dead medium tension, medium higher tension, I guess. And uh, yeah, yeah. But you're like you're straight trigger when you're like when you're live or in studio it's just yeah. a just a sample right so yeah we put a mic in the kick drum and we experiment with blending it but it's just it you know what you get with with the mic and the kick drum is you get the real time note yeah. so 
you can take your like the that's the first edit you're gonna do when you're with triggers is you're gonna make that little cut and you're gonna you know you're gonna you're gonna close the distance between the, whatever that millisecond delay is that the triggers hitting mm -hmm. um in a lot of cases the engineer will take a splitter and he'll take the trigger signal directly to the board you know before yeah. you know so they do that quite often too but yeah i don't know a lot of times i i actually kind of you know we were on tour at one point in time we were playing a lot of these metal fests and you know you'd get a you get a pushy ass sound guy that's just like well i'm gonna blend it don't worry i know how to do it no and, no Please i'd rather don't. you not um so start taking a kick drum without a without a port <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what I do. I always have uh, logos on the front of the kicks, and sometimes, like my my kit in uh, my studio right now, I have mesh heads on it. Oh yeah, yeah. So they're super quiet. Uh, they're not like loud and boomy whenever I'm recording. Like when I when I recorded in the studio, uh, the our mixing engineer loved me. He's like, thank you, because I can completely replace this and I don't have to worry about room or overheads or anything because the kick is like barely even there at all. Yeah, I so. have a I have a rolling kick pad for that effect. Yeah, pretty much it's the same thing, except Evans, I can just still use my full kick drums. And uh, yeah, I just have mesh heads on it and it's great. I I love it. I don't think I'll bring it on the road. Um, the next two I'm doing, there's like four bands and three of us are going to share a kit just to make everything easier. So, and the last couple tours have been like that. So, and guys don't like using mesh heads apparently. Um, so like live, all, they, they can, but once you get used to it, um, like it, it it felt just as fine as uh, as a regular head to me, so I was like, "Huh, eh, I can still play just as fast and consistent. I'm fine, you know." But it definitely makes sense for recording. Recording, yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same thing using a a rolling pad or anything mm -hmm. like that, right? Now, uh, I would never bust out a rolling pad live. But, oh man, uh, and you got the skip leg day drum kit. Yeah. <laughs> skip leg day drum kit drum kit's all big up here and then it's whoop, at the bottom and yeah. I don't like want skip leg day. I don't want to call anyone out but there was one show that I played with a guy and uh, some people would probably know him um, but then he used a, a rolling pad and I was like oh why'd you why'd you do that <laughs> there's dudes out there that swear by it and that's cool mm -hmm. You know, it's just I remember I I got this ongoing conversation with uh with Kyle from Vitriol, and he's just like, "Get rid of your kick drums; they're stupid. You don't need them." I'm like, "Yeah, but I don't like the look." He goes, "Why does the look matter?" I'm like, "Why do you got spikes and tattoos?" I, I mean, I was like, "I don't <laughs> like the look." <laughs> so, Dude, looks uh, matter. We're on stage; people are looking at us. You know, I don't know. It's but... like. There's a, there's a, I mean, I, I got, I feel like the guy from Acrecock was the first guy to do the kick pads on stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we all thought it was really cool because we had never seen anybody else do it. Um, I don't know if Jordan is still doing that or not, but you know, he was doing that way back when as well, but mm. it just not my thing. Um, there's, there's um hmm, the look is weird but what kind of gets me is there's no <laughs> haptic feedback i guess like yeah. it doesn't move air and i and i'll you know i'll holler about this all day long you know with with direct guitar rigs um it just does it, it seems to me there's not much warmth to the tone it's not much air being moved and you know that's and that's my old guy theory but yeah there's something about hitting a kick drum and it going boom that i can feel that you can't hear anyway yeah. there's still a satisfaction to that there's still a there's 
there's still a thing that I'm not quite ready to, you know, let loose with. I did a, mm -hmm. I did the neurectomy record on the rolling kick pad, and it was fine, you know. Yeah. I, in this, it, it, like in the studio is is one thing because everything's just under a microscope. You're just focusing on what is happening in that moment and everything when on stage it's different it's a connection with the audience you're playing with the whole band together to create the a, a sound to put out there it's very different than in the studio when you're just like trying to play as perfect as you can yeah right and you have to worry about all the different mics so then you know how they're being processed afterwards and if you can just take that kick out of the equation because it gets low end into everything um then it it just it'll make for a better result there when live it's like no you the more like energy that you're putting out the mm -hmm. more the crowd's going to receive right so that's how i think about it anyways that's why i use two kick drums because it's more so <laughs> more that i can have the more that they get yeah i can go back and forth on two kick drums but i just I think do, it looks sick that's it it does look sick i yeah, mean i like that i prefer the feel too so i prefer the feel of the single but yeah i kind of look like an overweight fusion drummer on stage <laughs> <laughs> um but whatever i mean it, you know I think I'm gonna do one kick drum on this upcoming tour. So yeah, we well, let's let's gear to haul too. So hey, you know, not too bad. I like it. I like more gear. Uh, got to get my workout in somehow. You know, you yeah. know, we don't have cabs or anything anymore. So I don't. That we got such little gear to carry. I have to bring more gear. I might get a third kick drum to bring. You get a know? third kick drum mounted get up it. in the center. Yeah, man up in the center and can play like this. Man up in the center the behind your head and hit it like behind you like Bobby Jarzenbeck. That would be sick. A gong drum behind just bong like that'd be dope. I I like that idea, man. But don't yeah. let anything happen on stage until you get your gong drum adjusted correctly. That's and right. you never have the memory lock set and just be like, "Well, I I got to flow with the day, you know. I have to set it up the way it feels in that moment. Don't play anything yet." <laughs> don't play don't play anything just leave it yeah yeah it's back on guitar players again oh yeah yeah uh all right man like we're uh we're getting we're getting down with time here um there was a bunch of other stuff that i wanted to talk about um like the the surgery that you recently had mm. um your bilateral carpal tunnel surgery uh because that must have been like it was getting wracking it was getting a little dark yeah when drumming's like your surgeon that was just like i can fix it and he fixed it and he fixed it and you're just now it's done there was there ever a moment where you're just like if this goes wrong my career is over well i was either not going to play drums anymore or not play drums anymore so you, there was no i'm able to play drums now yeah so yeah you, like you one to... one way or one way or another the path i was going it was going to be no drums yeah like so might as well take the chance took the yeah. chance and yeah so yeah, like it, it was a charity called music uh called um musician treatment foundation and you know i had to mm -hmm. answer a series of questions and show tax information and all that and provide you know that i'm a working musician and you know yeah I had to pay him 250 bucks and next thing you know went into the surgery now you're now you're back to blasting mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so i got these cool little you scars okay? now um can't really see them but yeah 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 you can see them in there yeah oh, yeah that's cool it, no, it was um i spoke with a friend and he goes talk to my friend and check out this website and we check out the website and we saw what it was it's a like i said it's called um it's called a musician treatment foundation it was started by elvis costello oh wow and uh he's got 
these guys got a team of physicians around the country and they all work out of different practices. And um, this, this doctor here in New York, he's got a practice in Manhattan and he's got one, I think, in Austin, Texas as well. So I, yeah, I had to fill out a form, had to have a phone call and explain what was up. And it was funny because I went in there and he did a strength test and all that kind of stuff. And, and he, you know, because I had already been through therapy once that slowed it down. It kind of it, it went away for a bit, but it, it came back because I, it just, I don't know. There's so many variables involved, and one of the variables involved in my life is sleeping on a van bench. Yeah, you know, doing van tours because not every you know. Luckily, these next two tours are going to be bus tours, but mm-hmm. a lot of cases, you know, sleeping on a van tour, having big shoulders. What do big shoulders do very easily? Exactly. You know? So when this happens, things start getting closed off. And so then you get what can be, you know, things, then you get like a lot of nerve impingement and double crush scenarios. But yeah, so he went in there and clip because you've got this little carpal band that because all your nerves, all your tendons go through this little U-shaped passage. Mm -hmm. And on top of that is your median nerve. And as there, everything swells, that nerve gets pushed up into the band, causing numbness and pain. So he goes in and he clips that little band and stitches you back up and leaves it. And the idea is that it will grow back together at a relaxed state rather than a tight state. And he got in there and he was like, it's really tight in here. Oh, my God. <laughs> like <a> snip. <laughs> and. Um, <clears throat> wow. And achiness, discomfort. I was in. I was in wraps for about five days. Mm-hmm. Two weeks. I went back to work in about a week and a half, and I was back full drumming in two weeks. About. Wow, two weeks recovering from that. That seems really fast. Of course, not playing origin songs, but, you but know, approaching drums. slower Slayer songs. Yeah. So, yeah. Still playing drums, you know, regardless of how insane it is. That still seems like uh, quite the feat to get back the on. Hardest, the hardest thing, the worst thing was having the stick hit that. Yeah. That was what took the longest. Was so I did a lot of uh, I did a lot of playing with like with like like this grip, you know this kind of oh weird. yeah, you know? <laughs> just so that it wasn't hitting on the palm. Yeah, yeah. 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 But um, after a while, it yeah. So now my hands don't fall asleep. You know, there's a lot of footage of me out there playing, and I and my hands are just completely fucking numb. Wow. Jesus. And that, that's been the quiet struggle for the past 10 years. Right. You know? yeah. I didn't even know I went back that far, but you know, I've, I've got friends that are like, yeah, you've been bitching about that for 10 years now. I'm glad you got it done. Like, oh shit. Probably should have got it looked at earlier, but you know, here well, we you know, I was, the doc was telling me that no permanent damage was done, but permanent damage was, you know, coming. So, yeah. It was imminent. Like it was going mm-hmm. to happen whether you liked it mm-hmm. or not. So like I said, like if the surgery went bad and I can't play drums, well, I wasn't gonna play drums anyway because the carpal tunnel was gonna take me down. Yeah. But I mean, when he when we were talking about we were talking about it with the surgeon, he's he's talking about it with all the intensity of like a barber cutting your hair. Yeah. Like it's <laughs> nothing. I go in there and do this and be fine, yeah, you'll be good. Yeah. Like, really? Hey. I know you're scared. Why don't more people get this done then? <laughs> like carpal tunnel is like a you know a big thing. So, surgery is fucking scary, dude. I dude, mean, I believe you it. Know, people don't want people don't want to get cut open. People don't want people you know fucking fucking around in their tendons. Drummers don't want their hands cut open. That's <laughs> very true. Yeah, they just don't <laughs> want their hands cut open. Um, it, I was like that was like it, it was just. Some people get desperate enough to where they're like, give me the thing. 
And so I was like, give me the thing. Yeah. And here you are, and you're heading back out on the road next month. It's going to be a sick tour. Uh, you guys are hitting all the spots on that one. Yeah. Some interesting spots there. Yeah. That's uh, with Vader and uh, Inhuman Condition. Yeah. Yeah. That should be yeah, sick. I'm corner Terry Butler and just ask him death, death questions all day long. <laughs> Perfect. Mm -hmm. That's going to be sick, man. Well, John, uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, it's been My awesome pleasure. chatting with you, man. And uh, I'm stoked to see you when you uh, come through Toronto here next month. Yeah, man, that'll be great. We'll have a beer. You can try out the pedals. Hell yeah, man. I definitely Good will. Luck. All right. Absolutely, man. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. See you soon. Thanks for listening to the We're Talking Drums podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share with your friends and check out our Patreon for exclusive content and early episodes. Till next time, keep drumming.